but we're starting a series called Hey Siri because we all have questions at times, right? And most often I use Siri to settle arguments of which I think I'm definitely right. Hey Siri, who actually played in this movie? Uh, sometimes Siri can be frustrating. No, I didn't want to call Tina because I don't know who Tina is. Why are you doing that? Uh, but we go, we go to get qu- answers to questions. Right now in my life, I feel like I'm the one who answers most of the questions ar- around the house because Cohen is three, and three years old means I ask about everything, about everything that ever was. Dada, why? Why do you need to wipe my bottom? Well, bud, I'm not gonna explain it here. We all know, right? <laughs> why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? And this, just the other day, like he's potty training, and so uh, he went, to the toilet successfully, no accident that time. And so uh, he went to, f- thank you, I appreciate that. That's a big, a big moment, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and his celebration dance is to flush the toilet because that's like the coolest thing in the world. It's like magic to him, he loves it. And so he went to flush the toilet and then he was st- looking over it and just looking down and I could tell like he's, he's wondering something. Like he's trying to figure something out and he just is like having this argument with himself and then he looks up at me and he says, I shouldn't put my head in there, should I, Dada? (laughs) And I said, no, (laughs) you know, no, you shouldn't. But I realized what he was thinking was, ooh, I really want to put my head in there. Ooh, probably shouldn't. Mama got mad at me the last time I put my hand in there. Head, ooh, no. He was having this argument, so he finally just asked uh, the question. And, and, but we all have those questions, and we can have those questions in church especially, and sometimes you don't know where to go with your questions in church because it's just like, everybody seems to know what's going on here, but I'm kind of new here, or I've been here a while, and I still don't really understand this basic thing, like, why did we just start singing together? Like, that doesn't happen very many other places in life, right? We're just, let's all stand and sing. That doesn't happen a lot of places except for church, or why did we do this? Why did we just eat some bread and some juice? Like, we, we have these questions that seem like we're the only ones who don't know the answer. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to answer some really, really basic fundamental questions because it's a good reminder for some and hopefully it's illuminating for others. And today's question is simply, why Jesus? Like, why would you follow Jesus when compared to any other religion or any other way of life? Why Jesus? And as I first started to prepare this message, my thought was, I'm going to develop a a synthesized apologetics lesson that's going to go logically point by point through all these different worldviews and give the good conclusion of why you should follow Jesus, which I could have done, but not as well as others have done many, many times before. A Case for Christ is one, Jesus Among Secular Gods by Ravi Zacharias is another. Like, those do a better job because I am no intellectual expert in any other worldview except for Christianity, and I've just been a Christian for the last 10 years of my life, and so I have some sort of expertise and perspective on Christianity. And so what I decided was the thing that I can do is tell you the story of why I chose Jesus, or the stories of why I chose Jesus. Because there have been these moments where he has just wrecked my heart and completely turned my life. For me, following Jesus and following him into full-time vocational ministry meant a significant course change in my life. And I just, if you were here three weeks ago, got through talking about the power of story. And so while apologetics would have been a kind of easy thing to prepare because there's plenty of source material, it would have kept the issue at arm's length and it wouldn't have gotten into, why did I choose Jesus? Like, why did I make my life about his mission and his calling? And so what I hope to offer you today is some things that have given me clarity on who God is and who Jesus is and why I chose Jesus when there are plenty of other things to choose. But I think Jesus is by far and away not even compar- comparably the best choice. And so we're going to go through a passage in Colossians 1, which is just a fundamental passage in my life. And so if you want to turn there, um, Colossians 1 is near the back of the New Testament. But will you pray with me as we begin? Father God, we hope to see you today. I hope to see your gospel. God, I pray that your gospel would stand clearer than anything and everything else would fall away we want to hear from your word. 
what you have for us and understand what you've done for us. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Colossians 1, uh, starting in verse uh, 17, going through verse 19, says this. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. As I first read that passage, it stood out to me, this idea that Jesus is, he is Jesus in this passage, and he is great and wonderful and beyond compare. And so the first point today is why Jesus? Because he is indescribable. You could not possibly put enough words around Jesus to fully and completely describe Jesus. Growing up and as a kid, I was the kid who loved to have the answers to the questions in class. Like I was everyone's favorite student in the classroom that just, yep, I know, you know, like actually nobody's favorite, like be quiet. But I loved to have the answers, and I did not like when I didn't have the answers to questions. And I went to a small group when I was a sophomore in high school, And we were answering questions, and the question that came up was, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? And I could not answer. I couldn't answer why. I'd gone to church my whole life, but I couldn't put words around why I believed in God. And so I just sort of stumbled through this really sort of pathetic answer of why, well, because I went to church that's why you believe in God, because you went to, it didn't really make sense, and so that drove me crazy, and so I started to study and think about uh, who Jesus was, which is what I think was my youth pastor at the time's whole entire goal, and so like, he tricked me into studying scripture, uh, but it worked out, I think, so um, I started studying, and the thing that I understood was the more that I study God and the more that I study Jesus, it's like as I get to a different level of understanding and I know more, I realize I know less. It was this weird thing, like this ever-widening tunnel of truth that I'm digging through, and as I get to another step forward, it's like, wait, but there's all of this beyond, and it's actually bigger than what I could have imagined. He is indescribable. I can't possibly even start to scratch the surface around the truth, the full truth of who God is. This is unbelievable, and that compelled my life. The curiosity hasn't worn off, and it still doesn't wear off, and I still, day by day, am stunned that I didn't realize completely this about who God was. There are plenty of times still that in, when we worship and when we're singing, I'll hear a lyric, and it's like, oh, wow, I can't believe that I didn't understand that about who God was before this moment. You'd think that I understood completely, but I just, I didn't, and it's unbelievable to me, day by day, to be stunned again by the greatness and the fullness of who God is. But there's also a message that I watched in high school. It was called Indescribable, and it was by a passive, uh, uh, speaker, his name's Louis Giglio, uh, leads the Passion Movement, leads the church in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and if you've never seen it, you should absolutely watch it. It will change your perspective, and I can't possibly do justice to as good of a job as he did with this subject, but what he attempted to do was to give scale to God, and he did that by saying over and over again the phrase, if the earth were the size of a golf ball, and he said, we are in a neighborhood within a city, inside a state, inside a country, on a continent, on this planet Earth, and we are some small fraction of that. And so let's scale down Earth to the size of a golf ball. Can you find yourself on here? If this were Earth, we'd be probably on the Nike check. But can you find yourself on there? And he said, if the Earth were the size of a golf ball, then he went outward and outward in this universe, the known universe, and compared different things sizes to the size of a golf ball. And I won't do the whole message, like I said, but a little teaser. If the earth were the size of a golf ball, so if the earth were this big, the sun would be 15 feet across. The sun would be 15 feet across. The closest star, just in our galaxy, 
In, in our solar system, within our galaxy, the closest star to us would be 15 feet across, and the sun is not even like the biggest star in the known universe. It's actually not even close. It's relatively small to average. It's just kind of a, I don't know, just a, a star. But the sun would be 15 feet across, and if that doesn't give you perspective enough, you could fit one million Earths inside the sun. You take a million of the planet that we are on, we're in a city, in a state, in a country, on a continent, on this planet, and you could fit a, multiply that by a million, and you could fit that inside the sun, and God spoke all of that into existence. If you didn't realize how many a million golf balls is, you, if you had a million golf balls, you could fill an entire school bus with golf balls if you had a million. The sun is big, and it's not even that big with what God created in the universe. He is indescribable because he spoke all these things into motion and he didn't even break a sweat. He just did it. It was just power that radiated from him. And he says still of us as we reside in our little fraction of a fraction of a fraction of his known universe, he still says of us that we're the prize of his creation because he spoke into us the breath of life. And he gave us something different. He created everything else in the known universe and said it was good. And he created us and said we're very good. We are the prize of his creation. He is indescribable above and beyond the universe. He is beyond compare and he is unfathomably large. And we are so, so small in comparison. And he still cares to number the hairs on our head. It's unbelievable that this king who resides over everything, cares enough about us to call us by name and bring us home. He is magnificent and he can do extraordinary things. And so why Jesus? Because he is indescribable. Over the years, millions of hours have been spent describing this man and describing this God. And we haven't even scratched the surface of the depth of the greatness and the wonder of all that he is. He is the creator of the impossible and he is impossible to define. But why else? Because it's not just good that he's big and powerful. It's also that he died for us. And I don't think that this is going to come as a shock to a ton of people in the room. I mean, you're at a, a Christian church, like, and we just took communion. Like, this is not surprising, but it should be surprising every day that this God who spoke the universe into existence died for us. He created everything. And he came into one part of his creation to live with the prize of his creation and then die for them. Colossians 1, 20 through 22 says this. And through him, Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, he died for to make peace by the blood of his cross. In that same small group that I was in, we did this exercise where we tried to memorize scripture. We got these little scripture cards, and it was like, keep this with you all week long and memorize this scripture. And I've never been really, really great at memorizing things. Um, and so I really only remember the very first one that we did. I, I mean, I remember more scripture now, but the first verse that I ever memorized, and the only one that I actually remember doing in that small group was the first one, and it was Isaiah 53, 5. And it just said, and he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. I had just seen this message about how big and powerful God is and how he holds all things together. And then I memorized this verse. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we're healed. 
And for some reason, I don't know what it was exactly, but as I understood that verse, and as I memorized that verse, it made it more real than ever for me. That it wasn't just some far off story that Jesus had died and that he was you know, long gone and the death had been conquered and whatever. For some reason, it made me realize that like, oh, when I have a cut and there's pain on my arm, like that same pain but multiplied by a magnitude that I can't understand, he suffered for me. And yet he was there as the word of creation. It was unbelievable to me as I took this very large God that I was suddenly understanding his scale or trying to understand his scale, that he would limit himself and come onto earth. Not just to come onto earth, but to die for us, to let his creation destroy him so that his creation could get back to the creator. Imagine that to limit the power that you have to speak light and stars and things into existence and allow yourself to be hung on a cross so that the people who are hanging you on a cross can get no punishment. It was this this crazy moment of clarity where I realized that God is indescribable in his power and his majesty and his rule and reign, and he is unbelievable in the amount of grace that he will give to people who do not deserve it. The people who were punishing him, he was taking the punishment away from. It doesn't make sense. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. There's this phrase that King Nebuchadnezzar utters in Daniel as three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have been thrown into a fire because they won't worship the pagan gods of King Nebuchadnezzar's day. And they're thrown into a fire, and they had said, like, look, you can do whatever you want to us. We trust God completely to save us. He will rescue us. And so they're thrown into a fire, and Nebuchadnezzar's like, they're done for. You know, they're going to burn up. I just turned that furnace all the way up, and they're in there. And then he's watching, and he's like, how many people did we throw into the fire? Because he killed people all the time, I guess. He couldn't remember which day it was. And he's like, Well, we threw three in, but now we see four, and they're walking and dancing and singing in the fire. We don't understand what's happening. And so Nebuchadnezzar's like, well, bring those guys back up here. And he brought them back up, and it's funny because Daniel notes that they don't even smell like a campfire. Um, They just are like completely unscathed by being in the furnace. And he's like, what's the deal? This is a total paraphrase, by the way, if you're wondering. Like, what's the deal is not in any translation of Scripture. But Nebuchadnezzar's like, what, what happened? And they're like, well, we told you. Our God would save us. And we trusted him completely. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no other God can save in this way. And that's what I realized when I memorized Isaiah 53, 5. No other God has even offered to save in this way. No other God can save in this way. And so I will follow no other God because no other God sacrifices so that man could come closer to God. Other gods, little g gods, say, you sacrifice to get closer to me. Jesus says, I'll sacrifice to show you the way to live. I will be pierced for your transgressions. I will be crushed for your iniquities. And I'll take the punishment that will bring you peace and you will be healed by my wounds. No other God can save in this way. And so I will follow no other God. And it was very late in high school that I realized that, and it completely turned my life from going to a a world of science and math and engineering to saying, I want to spend my entire life talking about and trying to describe the love of this God who offers grace upon grace and unthinkable grace to people who don't deserve it. I want to spend my whole life being about what he's about. Because we're not done yet. Why Jesus? We're not done yet. It's not just that he's indescribable. It's not just that he died for us. That would be a complete gospel and it would be great. But there's this other third part of it. He chooses us. He chooses us. It's unbelievable that he invites us to participate in what he's doing in the world. He chooses us. He invites us to be on his team. It's like moving up to varsity when you are barely in the rec leagues. You don't deserve to be on the field, but somebody on the team has said, hey, come and participate with me, and we'll do this thing. God has called us onto and to be part of what he's doing in this world. And there's a picture of this in Isaiah chapter 6. 
where Isaiah is drawn up into the throne room of heaven. And he's standing there and he sees God high and exalted. And he's describing the scene and he says that he sees angels flying, wings covering their eyes and covering their feet. And they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they're singing so loud that the, the posts in the room are shaking. And it's just this overwhelming experience because God, or Isaiah is seeing indescribable God face to face. And his response isn't like, wow, I like it here. This is nice. You know, his response is, oh, no, I am ruined right now. Because there's nothing standing between sinful, inadequate me and holy and complete God. There is no buffer right here. The power of God is just going to decimate me. And he says, why? He says this. He says, woe to me, I am ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord God Almighty. My eyes have seen the Lord Almighty. And so I'm ruined. He is going to take me out, and he has every right to take me out because of the things that I've said and the things that I've heard people around me say. Like even the things that he's heard people say, I've come from a people of unclean lips, and he thinks that's going to wipe him out. And so he is just overwhelmed by insecurity and insignificance in this moment. And God gives us a picture of how he responds to us when we're standing in our insecurity and we're standing in our insignificance because an angel flies over who's taken a, a coal from the altar of God, and he flies over, and he touches the coal to Isaiah's mouth and says, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. God doesn't want to wipe us out as we see his greatness and his glory, he wants to equip us to do his work in the world. You see, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You see, I'm going to lead with grace. I'm going to lead with mercy. You don't have to stand feeling insecure, insecure and insignificant right now. I'm not going to ruin you. I'm going to heal you. I will fly over and fix exactly what you think is most broken in your life and give you a chance to walk with me. Because the funny thing that happens next is, Isaiah said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I don't think that God in this moment is actually like stumped. Like, oh, shucks. If only we had somebody. You know, there's one human being that lives on earth standing in his throne room. I don't think that it's like, ah, I can't figure out exactly who I would go. It's, I think it's more like when a, a dad plays hide and go seek with his kid, and I played hide and go seek with Cohen just this last week, and we have like sheer curtains in our living room. Like they're not the block out the sun kind of ones that you can see through them, and he was hiding behind that. And I came into the room, and he was just cracking up because he was so excited that he found such a great spot, and he thought it was hilarious that I wouldn't be able to find it. And so I walk in the living room, like, oh, where's Cohen? And I see him, like, ah, here I am, you know, behind the curtain, because it's a see-through curtain. You know, like, I didn't, I wasn't actually, like, stumped about where Cohen was. I could see him, but he just wanted me to call out to him. And so God's saying, who will I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. I'll go. I got these brand new lips. Look, I'll use these to talk about you. You just, you know, cleared them up. So I'm good. I will go for you because unbelievable grace from an indescribable God sends us out. No other God can save in this way, and so I will follow no other God. Why Jesus? Because even though we don't deserve to be in the same sentence as him, he sees fit to invite us into his mission to restore the world. He's no longer asking, who will I send? He's given us a command to love God, love people, and live on mission in this world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. Therefore, go. 
You go and you lead with grace the same way that I've led with grace with you. Go and baptize people and tell them that they can have a new life in Christ, that they can be washed away, that they can be made new through baptize. Baptize people first and then teach them And then teach them what's found in this book. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And we just spent the last three weeks realizing that the top two things Jesus has commanded us to do is love God and love people. And so go and live on this mission in his world. Therefore, go and participate in bringing healing to the hurting and bringing wholeness to the broken. Therefore, go. This past week, Emily got a a really small cut uh, on her toe. And it was like one of those cuts that was so small that it didn't hurt until way after. And so she still doesn't know how she cut her toe. She's going to make it, though. We'll be all right. Uh, But she was looking at it, and she said, like, oh, Adam, will you you go get me a Band-Aid? And I said, no. I said, yeah, I did. I went and got the Band-Aid and went into the, I got up from the couch and went toward the kitchen. And Cohen said, can I go with you, Dada? I said, yeah, absolutely, bud. Come on. And so I got down the band-aids, which Cohen was uh, completely obsessed with because band-aids to little kids are like stickers on steroids. It's like this, this toy that also somehow heals you. Like I don't understand because stickers are just playthings, but band-aids, come on now, you know? And so uh, he was picking out a band-aid for Emily and he got a sadness one from inside out because she was hurt, you know, and he said, mama wants the sadness one. Okay, you know, and so then I was holding the Neosporin, and he looked at me and said, what's that, Dada? And I didn't know how to describe it, you know? And I was like, it's triple antibiotic, and it will clear me. I was just like, uh, this is, it's lotion. It'll help your mama feel better. He's like, okay, and then he ran out with his Band-Aid, because that was the cool thing. I got the lame thing, he got the cool thing, and so he took the Band-Aid to to Emily, and I walked out with the Neosporin, and she, you know, put the Band-Aid on or whatever, and she's sitting there on the couch, and then Cohen leaves the room. And it's like 8.30 at night, so I thought, he's going to go and get ice cream because he wants some sugar rush so that he doesn't have to fall asleep because that's what he does. He goes to the uh, freezer every night, and I tell him, no, you can't have ice cream. I get it. Like, I want some ice cream, too, right now, but no. And so I'm thinking, like, oh, I'm going to have to put away another ice cream thing. Uh, but he comes back out, and he has this big bottle of hand lotion, And he walks up to Emily, and he says, here you go, Mama. This will help you feel better. As as hilarious as it was, I was so proud of him. Not because he got it right, but because he was willing to participate in that moment. He heard what I said, and he also wanted to help her feel better. And so he went and got what he knew was lotion. And let me tell you, the Father that we have in heaven is the same way. He doesn't want us to get it exactly right, but hear the word and go and participate in what he's doing in the word. Here you go. Here you go. This will help you feel better. You feel broken in the word? Here. Look here. There's life in here because Jesus died for us. This indescribable king came and died for us and is inviting us into full life. Here, this, this will help. I'll show you, I'll teach you what is in here if we would just be willing to participate in what God has commanded us to do. We could bring healing to this world. Love God, love people, and live on mission because no other God can save in this way. So I will follow no other God. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are blown away, astounded by who you are and the grace that you offer. God, help us, help us to see that it's not that you want to wipe us out. It's not that you want to call us out for our sin and shame. It's that you want to call us out from our sin and shame and give us wholeness and completeness and make us live again. And so we trust your grace. We trust your mercy and we follow the life that you've shown us. We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I don't know what your next step is, but for all of us, could we just wonder about Jesus again?
and be amazed by him again and go and look at what he actually said and what he actually did and let the you know, assumptions of the world fall away and just look at what he said about us and look about what, what he calls us to and the life that he called us to and understand what it is that he's about. And if you've never, I mean, if you've never been stunned by Jesus before, if you've never seen him completely and you've never surrendered your life to him, today can be the day. There is no class that you have to go to to start following Jesus. There is no prerequisites. There is just this, this, just this decision, I'll follow you. For the rest of my life, I'll follow you. Nothing else compares. Nothing else compares. I want the grace that you offer and the life that you show. And so will we go? But for all of us, can we teach people to obey all that Jesus has commanded? Love God, love people, and then let's live on mission.